Again, I say to you what you already know. It is the holy season. It is the most wonderful time of the year. It is that time of year where we celebrate the birth of our Savior, the birth of God's only begotten Son, mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, who we will see John say here today in our key verse, is the testimony of God. All right. All right. A testimony we should know stands as a witness. It is a solemn declaration usually made orally by a witness. It is a first-hand authentication. All right. All right. Those that sell a service or products, they love to have others give a testimony. All right. Come on. Come on. They love to have others give a testimony for the reason and the purpose that they want to convince others to give their service or their product mm-hmm. a try. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Testimonies, they build trust mm. as they act as endorsements, as they are a form of proof mm-hmm. that their service or their product is as good as they say it is. Mm-hmm. All right, come on. So when we consider what a testimony is Mm -hmm. and that Jesus is the testimony of God, it should make us wonder. Mm -hmm. It should make us wonder why did God need a testimony? It should make us wonder, well, what is his product? What is his service? If you will. What was it that Jesus testified of? Have you ever given that thought for a moment? Well, if you have not, we will do so today. Let's give this thought for just a moment. If we, if we take a moment to go back to the garden, we know that the desire the Lord had for mankind was the desire, the intent for us, mankind, to be fruitful. That is, he desired for us to prosper. He desired for us to multiply. Mm -hmm. God created mankind with the desire to also dwell with us, not temporarily, but to dwell with us forever. That is, eternally. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. But unfortunately, mankind fell to the deceptions of the devil. We ended up going against God's desires by becoming sinners. Mm -hmm. The very people that the Lord would never dwell with. This is a fact that is shown to us in the 59th chapter of of Isaiah and the second verse where it is stated that the iniquities of man separates us from the Lord. Mm -hmm. In that verse, we are told that Israel, because of their sins, Mm -hmm. God hid his face from them. Not only did God hide his face from Israel, he also did not hear them. This again was not something that God desired to ever do to mankind. God did not desire to be separate. He did not desire to be apart. He did not desire to be away from man. Yes, sir. So after mankind's fall in the garden, Mm -hmm. there was a promise that was made by God himself. Mm -hmm. Now, Ted, this promise, it was made with a certain desire in mind for the Lord. Mm -hmm. In the third chapter of Genesis, we see that God promised to destroy Satan. Mm -hmm. He promised to destroy sin as well. Mm -hmm. Now, why did God make this promise? Why did he promise to destroy Satan? Why did God promise to destroy sin? Well, the answer to that question is, again, he had a desire. He still had a desire to dwell with us, mankind. Mm -hmm. To Noah, after the great flood, God, he promised never to destroy mankind. Mm -hmm. 
God's eternal desire, I tell you again, it was in mind when he made that promise to Noah. Mm -hmm. When the Lord sought to destroy, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, mm -hmm. he spoke with Abraham about, again, his desire to save those who would be righteous. Again, I tell you that his eternal desire was in mind. Mm -hmm. To his chosen king, David, as we saw here in our Sunday school lesson for this week, God promised that one would sit on an everlasting throne and have an everlasting kingdom. Again, I tell you that God's eternal desire for mankind was in mind. And I tell you today that God, he stuck to, he kept that promise that he made to David, mm -hmm. even after David's great sin mm -hmm. and the great sin of Israel, the great sin of Judah, mm -hmm. where they departed from the Lord, God still kept his promise to David because he had that eternal desire for mankind in mind. So when we ask, why did the Lord need to provide a testimony of himself? The answer would be because of sin. The answer would be because of his desire to save us mankind from sin. God, he needed to convince us. He needed to convince us to turn away from sin. He needed to convince us to turn away from wickedness for something, for a way that was far better than the way in which we mankind were walking in. In order to convince us to turn away from wickedness, the Lord, he needed to send a witness. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me here today? Mm -hmm. God, he needed to send a witness that had a firsthand authentication of his eternal desire of his eternal promise. Mm -hmm. Now, did the Lord send an angel to give a testimony of his heavenly kingdom? Mm -hmm. The answer to that question would actually be no. Gabriel, he, he did come to announce the coming of the one that would testify of his eternal promise. But Gabriel, he did not necessarily testify of eternity to mankind. The, the writer of Hebrews stated it best when they wrote in the first chapter of Hebrews that the Lord sent greater than an angel to testify of his eternal desire for mankind. Mm -hmm. God, we know, gave the world his only begotten son, and God gave the world his only begotten son to testify of himself, to testify of his heavenly kingdom. Mm -hmm. All right. So how great of a testimony could the son of God give to mankind? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say to all of you today that his son could give what we would say is better than a five star review. His only begotten son could give us a testimony, a review of God's eternal desire and promise that could be trusted. In other words, I want you to understand today that Jesus is a trusted source. We do not have to question his word. We don't have to question his review. We do not have to question his testimony. I don't know if you hear me here today. Jesus, the word of God, he came directly from eternity with his testimony. Christ just said here in our reading today of our response reading in the fifth chapter of first John, the sixth verse, 
He said that Jesus came by water and by blood. Yes, blood, as you will figure it, it is representative of the flesh, mm-hmm. which John said in his gospel and in the 14th verse of the first chapter was made flesh. Water, on the other hand, Jesus taught Nicodemus spoke to life that is of the spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus that unless one is born of water and spirit, they cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So Christ coming by water and by blood signified that Jesus was both of the flesh, but also of the spirit as well. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he is holy and he is divine. In other words, I tell you today that there could be no better witness of heaven. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me here today? Mm -hmm. Jesus, as we know, was God in the flesh. So I would ask you this question today. Who would or who could be a better witness of God's eternal desire? God's eternal promise, God's heavenly kingdom better than the Lord himself. Who could be a better witness of heaven than God? Mm-hmm. Yet many have and many still do reject the testimony of God. And we have said that the testimony of God is his son. That's what we saw John say. And that's what we say today because we believe it. In his first letter, Peter, he touched on the thought of the testimony of God being Jesus. And he touched on the testimony of God being rejected by mankind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Peter, he quoted scripture from the book of Psalms and from the book of Isaiah Mm -hmm. in first Peter, the second chapter in the six through the eight verse where he said, and I quote, behold, I, the I there being God lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone Mm -hmm. elect precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, Mm -hmm. but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone Mm -hmm. and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, who is the chief cornerstone that the Lord laid in Zion? that was rejected. Jesus, he identifies himself as the chief cornerstone that was rejected and had become a stone of stumbling. So we must ask today, well, why was Jesus the testimony of God? Why was he rejected? Why was he rejected in his day? Why was he rejected in Peter's days? Why is the testimony of God? Why is Jesus? Why is he now rejected still in our days? Within that same passage from first Peter, Peter He said that those who reject, those who stumble, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. So to answer that question, many choose to reject the testimony of God because they are disobedient. They would rather adhere to their own word rather than the word of God. People are disobedient to the word of God because they believe that they know better than God. So 
Imagine this for a moment. Believing you know more about a product that you have never used compared to one who's actually used the product and decided to give you a testimony, a review of that product. All right. All right. Doesn't sound like it make a lot of sense, does it? You would seem rather foolish, wouldn't you? Uh, uh, imagine this for a moment. Speaking about a restaurant that you have never gone to, to someone who's actually gone to that restaurant and can tell you all about it. Doesn't seem like it would make much sense, does it? To act like you know more than they do. It would seem rather foolish, wouldn't it? So I would ask all of you today, how could we ever reject the testimony of God? That is his eternal desires, his, his eternal promise, heaven. How could we ever question it? How could we reject believing the testimony of God saying that we know more than Christ himself who came from heaven and testified of heaven of God and his eternal desires and promises firsthand. How can we say that we know better than Christ? In the eighth chapter of Isaiah from the 14th through the 20th verse, we will see where the Lord spoke through the prophet about mankind's stumbling and rejection of his testimony. All right. Rather than binding up the testimony of God in their hearts and waiting on the Lord Israel in their own knowledge and in their own wisdom, they chose to seek mediums and wizards over the Lord. Is that what you do today? All right. God has given you his testimony. He has given us his only begotten son whose birth we celebrate all of this month. And I will tell y'all, I celebrated from January all the way down to December, but is that what you do today? Would you seek the mediums and wizards of this world over God, over his only begotten son, over his word, over his testimony? Is that what you do? You say, oh, Jesus, the review of heaven, man, that ain't hidden on nothing. I don't believe it. I'm going to go and consult this thing. I'm going to go and consult this medium. I'm going to go and consult this wizard about heaven because this medium and this wizard, it knows better than Jesus. Is that what you do today? The Lord asked there in again, that eighth chapter of Isaiah, he has should not a people seek their God. God again, he is all powerful. God again, he is all knowing. God, again, he is everywhere at all times. God, again, he is our maker. He is our creator. So it would seem to certainly make sense, the most sense to me, that if you have the ear of God, if you have his eyes on you, it would seem to make the most sense to me that you would go and consult him first over anything else that you would rather adhere to his word over any medium, over any wizard, that you would adhere to his testimony over anything else. However, the truth of the matter is that many of us would rather consult and seek those wizards, those mediums. We rather consult the, the council of fools mm -hmm. over the Lord. Foolishly, many of us would rather follow after the testimony of a fool. That is false reports. That is doctrines. That is the conspiracies that come from a fool. 
over the testimony of God. Because again, we, we believe it in our hearts today that man apparently knows better than its maker, its creator, the one who is all knowing. Make that make sense to me. Because I tell you all today that it just doesn't make any sense to me. That rather than consulting the Lord who has told us that he is standing by. Mm -hmm. Willing and ready to listen to us and then move on our behalf. That instead of going to him, we rather go elsewhere. What good does it do for us to disregard and to ignore the Lord? What good does it do for us to ignore and disregard the word of God for foolishness? I heard none good. I agree with that answer. It does us no good. It only leads to destruction. So God gave us his testimony in the flesh Mm -hmm. to convince and to turn us away from the testimony of fools for a way of strength Mm -hmm. and for a way of judge said in our response of reading today, a way of life. Mm -hmm. I encourage you today that it is the perfect season for you to turn to the Lord and it's saving testimony if you have not done so already. Some say that if the Lord came before them and showed them heaven and his great works, some say that they would believe in him. Yet again, we know that the testimony of God, we know that it has been rejected in the flesh when it stood right before men and they could behold it. They could lay hands on it. It was rejected. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus, he expressed this thought to us through the parable of the wicked vine dressers. In the 21st chapter of Matthew's gospel, the 33rd through the 44th verse, we see Jesus, he teaches this parable. And in this parable, Jesus, he spoke of a landowner that had planted a vineyard that he then leased out to some vine dressers. Mm -hmm. Landowner, I want you to understand in that parable is representative of the Lord and the vine dressers. They were representative of the children of Israel. Jesus, he said in that parable in the 33rd and in the 34th verse, he said that when vintage time came around, he said that the landowner desired to collect the fruit of the vineyard. And so the landowner, he sent his servants to go in to collect. But the vine dressers, they took his servants and they dealt harshly with the servants. Jesus said that the vine dressers, they beat one servant, they killed one and they stoned another. After the vine dressers did that, we are told again that the landowner reached out again. The landowner sent another group of servants to go out and to collect. And again, Jesus said that the vine dressers, they repeated the very same actions. They beat one, they killed one, and they stoned another. Let's understand that the vine dressers, they were being incredibly ungrateful. They were being ungrateful for what they had been given by the landowner. This pattern, it spoke to how the Lord was reaching out to, at that time, the children of Israel about, again, his eternal desire for them. But they were so ungrateful that they wanted nothing to do with it. They responded by repeatedly rejecting the prophets Mm -hmm. that were sent on the Lord's behalf. Now, after the vine dressers had dealt harshly with the landowner's servants, we are told again by Jesus in that parable that the landowner, he decided that he wanted to send his only son with the belief that the vine dressers would respect 
his son, that they would listen to his son, that they would not treat his son harshly. However, the vine dressers, they were so caught up in their ways of wickedness that they also dealt harshly with the son. They again rejected his son. And Jesus said in that parable that they killed him with the belief that they would be able to seize the inheritance. Mm. This again speaks to how Israel, the Jews at that time, dealt with Jesus. They still believed that they would inherit God's eternal desire, God's eternal promise of heaven. Jesus, he made it clear that he was the son that was being antagonized while testifying of God. Jesus, he testified of God by doing all kinds of good throughout the land. All right. God, he sent his testimony through his only begotten son because man was not listening to anybody else that he had been sending to them. If they did not listen to anybody else, the hope was that they would listen to the only begotten son of God. Who are you listening to today? Let us consider the testimony that was being rejected by the Jews. Jesus, he in person, he testified of God's love. He did never turn anybody away. When they came to Jesus, Jesus, he saw to them. Jesus, he again in person, he testified of God's mercy. He testified of God's forgiveness. When they brought the woman who they said was caught up in the act of adultery, they sought for Jesus to stone her. And Jesus said, you are forgiven. Turn them away. Jesus, he testified that the Lord truly desired to dwell with mankind forever as he preached that he was the way to heaven and that all man needed to do was follow his way, follow his instructions, be obedient mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. to his instructions mm -hmm. to keep his testimony. Yeah, yeah. The testimony of God. You have heard me express to you how troubled I am at the ungratefulness of man when it comes to all that God has done for us. All right. The fact that the Lord gave us his testimony in the flesh combined with the fact that God still desires to dwell with each of us after we have lived in the sin for so long, it should not be mocked. God should not be mocked. God should not be taken for granted. All right. All right. We ought to be thankful for God's love. We ought to be thankful for God's testimony. We ought to be thankful for all that the Lord has done rather than be ungrateful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Jews were ungrateful and they ended up stumbling because of their disobedience. Yeah. Yeah. Their disobedience, it caused them to go blind to the testimony of God that stood right before them. A testimony that could save. I don't know if you hear me here today. Many of us, we stumble today over the testimony of God because of our disobedience. There are many that go blind to the testimony of God because they believe they know everything. They know better than God. They go blind to God because of their wisdom. Even after the son of God, God still reaches out to us today. God has sent into the highways, the message of his testimony mm -hmm. through preachers, through teachers and all who join in ministering God's gospel of love, of mercy 
in salvation. Yet the genuine ministering of the testimony of God, it is met head on with those that seek to challenge the wisdom of God with their own intellect, the intellect of man. For example, at this time of year, we celebrate the birth and the manifestation of Christ who brought God's testimony directly from heaven to man. But it is again now met with mockery. It is now met with bitterness. It is even met with disgust. There are many people in the world today that are disgusted that we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave us again a saving testimony. The birth of Christ, because of man's wisdom, it has become the greatest stone of stumbling. Some suggest God coming in the flesh to be impossible Mm -hmm. because there is no proof Mm -hmm. of Christ. Mm -hmm. That is what they say. There is no proof. Show me the proof. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, he would disagree with such a thought. And he made it clear that he had one that could bear witness of him. When accused of not being able to prove his divinity, Jesus said, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness, it is true. For I know where I came from and I know where I am going. I am one who bears witness of myself and the father who sent me bears witness of me. If the witness of the father is not good enough proof for some, John wrote that there is another that bears witness of the only begotten son of God. After his resurrection and his ascension, this other one came again from heaven to dwell in the hearts of those who genuinely believe in the son. The Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. named Comforter, Mm -hmm. came from heaven to dwell in the hearts of believers. And the Holy Spirit, I tell you today, stands as a witness to the testimony of God in Christ. And Jesus told the disciples that bearing witness of Christ, it is the purpose, it is the work of the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. in our hearts. In the 16th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus said, he, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. Jesus said, for he, the Holy Spirit, will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit, I want you to know today, the Holy Spirit is at work. Mm -hmm. John, remembering exactly what Christ taught him about the Holy Spirit, stated that it is the Holy Spirit who bears witness of the testimony of God because the Spirit of God, it is the truth. That is what is being witnessed in our hearts today. Mm -hmm. What has the Spirit testified to us? The Spirit has testified that God is love. The spirit has testified to us that through our faith in Christ, we have victory. We have victory over sin. We have victory over Satan. We have victory over the punishment of sin. That is death. God has given us his testimony, his proof of his eternal desire through his son. And now through the Holy Spirit to convince us to believe in him. So I tell you today that the onus isn't on God to prove himself. He has already done that for mankind. Who is the onus on today? The onus, I tell you, it is now on us. The onus is on mankind to look at Jesus's testimony, his review, in other words, and it is on us to either believe his review, his testimony or not. Do you believe it to be true or do you believe it to be one of those fake reviews that you can find online about a destination? 
And then when you get to the destination, you find out, oh, they was lying about it. It don't look the way they said it looked. It don't look like I did in the pictures. Mm -hmm. Do you believe Jesus' testimony or not? The onus, it is on us today. As David said in the 34th Psalm, I personally have sought the Lord and the Lord, he heard me. And I tell you today that God, he delivered me from all of my troubles. You see, I listened to Christ. I listened to his testimony mm -hmm. and I decided to give God a try. And I saw for myself that what Jesus said, it was true. Yes. Have you given God a try today? to see if what Jesus said was true. For all you that may be questioning the Lord today, understand that Jesus is the best one to give us a review of God. Listen to his testimony. And I tell you today, I encourage you today, give the Lord a try. I want you to know that we can be confident in Jesus's testimony. We can be confident because we have three in heaven that bear witness to the testimony of God. That is what John wrote there in the seventh verse. John writes that we have the father who testified of his promises through the prophets. John writes that secondly, we have the son who testified of the eternal promise face to face with mankind. Thirdly, John said that we have the Holy Spirit that bears witness of this testimony. This is God in three persons working in unity to convince, to convince all of us, to convince the world, to turn away from wickedness and to turn to his way, to live in his way, to keep it, to be obedient to his way. And if those witnesses aren't good enough for us, we also, John said, have three on earth that bear witness to the testimony of God. On earth, John said, we have the Holy Spirit that works to convince us of the truth in our hearts again. John says, secondly and thirdly, we have the water and we have the shed blood of Christ. Oh, yes. These things he shed when they pierced him in the side on the cross. Mm -hmm. These three John wrote, agree as one. He said there in the eighth verse. All right. All right. John said there in the ninth verse that if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is what? It is greater. The witness of men we must consider can be corrupted because of our sinful nature. Therefore, the witness of man, it can be fallible because we are fallible creatures. If you on occasion would believe a fallible witness, surely I say to you today, surely, you can believe the witness of one who knows no lies and is perfect. Surely you can believe the witness and the testimony of God in Christ. As I consider my life, the many prayers that I have prayed and have seen how the Lord has moved on my behalf, I know that the testimony of God is certainly true. And that you can be confident in it just as I am confident in it. John wrote, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. When you give God a try, you will see for yourself that God is good and that, that the testimony of Jesus, that it is true. All of this is true, thanks be to God for giving us his testimony through his only begotten son that was born in this world for all of us. 
So this holiday season, I again, I encourage all of you to look at the testimony of God that was given to us through Christ. And I encourage you to again, give him a try. And you will see that the Lord truly is good. And you will see that again, he is the absolute best gift, the greatest gift that you will ever receive. Amen. Amen. Amen.